All right. We are live. I can already see a ton of people here on uh, YouTube. And now we'll give it just a minute to um, get some people on Facebook as well. Uh, welcome everybody to our webinar. Um, we're going to give everybody a couple of minutes to join. It takes a minute for everything to kind of catch up. Oh, there it went. <laughs> it goes from like nobody watching to a ton of people watching between one moment and the next. Okay, now I've got some people on Facebook as well. So, uh, okay, uh, can y'all let me know if the audio is working? Somebody asked if they were missing the audio or if it's just her. Let me see. Hello, are we good? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Stefan just went behind my, my white screen. <laughs> Okay, somebody else said they can't hear either. Okay, you can hear me, right, Heather? Oh, yeah, Jill? I can hear you. Okay. Um, okay, somebody else said good audio, and somebody else says sounds hmm. good now. Okay, let's hope that it was just a little blip. If you have trouble, okay, good. Lots of people saying they can do it. Um, you can always switch from, like, if you're watching on Facebook, try it on YouTube. If you're watching on YouTube, try it on Facebook but everything seems to be okay now. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, we are so excited. I am so excited to have Heather on here. Um, this was absolutely Heather's idea to show us all of the iterations of her map. And when she showed it to me, when we were getting ready, I was like, blown away. I was like, this is gonna be the coolest webinar to see from the judge's perspective how she designed the finals, like what it started at, why she made every change that she made. Um, I think it's just a really, really cool behind the scenes look at a course that, you know, a lot of people have been talking about how um, interesting this course was to watch and run um, at the National Agility Championships this weekend. So welcome, Heather. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. Yeah. Hopefully this won't be too geeky. I love the design, <laughs> so I was excited to be able to present this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the first thing that I want everybody to do, especially those of you um, who are watching on Facebook, is just take a moment to share this webinar. Uh, it's free for everybody. Um, and so that way uh, we we can um, get the word out um, and uh, really take advantage of Heather's time and get all of your burning questions answered about the finals and about course design and things like that. Okay. So I'm going to be scanning the comments to see, to make sure everything's okay. Um, but let's go ahead and get started. And, and mostly I'm going to, I'm going to let Heather take it away here um, and talk us through her process here. So Heather, I'm going to go to the next slide. All right. Sounds good. All right. So I was really honored by AKC to be asked to judge the national championships and especially honored when they asked me to design the finals course. So um, the first thing I did was sit down and think about what is a national champion because I wanted that to guide um, the elements that were within my course. So a couple things I think about the national championships. One, I feel like it's a team. It's just not the dog that's a national championship. It's that dog and that handler um, working together, all the training that the handler has put in and just their teamwork on course. So to me, I wanted the winning um, – team to be both the handler and the dog. So therefore I had some elements um, that relied on the dog strengths and I had some elements that relied on the handler strengths and then I had some elements um, that relied on the teamwork. So that was really important to me. Um, I feel like at local trials, for a lot of people, agility is a hobby. For a lot of people, it's a sport. A lot of people are somewhat in between. Um, but at the national championship level, I felt like it needed to lean more towards being a sport. So for that reason, um, I wanted the course to demonstrate both physical and mental skills from both the dog and the handler. And I wanted it to show exceptional dog training. I feel like that's really important in any of the AKC events, um, teamwork, and then trust between the handler and the dog. So that was kind of um, my starting point. And with that, I made a list um, of things that from the dog, from the handler, and from dog training were elements that I could put in the course um, that would meet my definition of what a national champion is. So for the dog, um, some of the things that jumped in my mind was just jumping skills, um, things like can they jump on a slice, can they jump collected, can they jump extended, um, turning skills, of course, I feel is very important in agility. And then I wanted both extension and collection 
my style is to have mostly extensions, so I wanted to make sure there was some collection elements in there as well. Um, and then for the handler, I wanted to have places where I challenge their appropriate assumption, which is the handler's awareness of where they are and kind of the 3D space on the course. It's like the obstacles, the dog, the handler, are you off the dog's path? Um, I wanted some strategy elements and I wanted there to be handling choices um, where teams that are strong on front crosses can do fronts. If you're strong on blinds, you can do blinds. If you're strong on rears, you can do rears, but you have that choice um, and not everybody would handle the same. And then I was thinking about some elements related to dog training. So I wanted places where having good obstacle commitment would be an advantage. And then I wanted places where having advanced independent obstacle performance would also be an advantage. But also where if you didn't have those things, could you get through the course? Yes, but you would lose out on the advantages um, that those would provide. So that was what I had in mind that I was trying to achieve. Um, when I started out with the first version. So um, with that, you want to go to the first version and y'all will see it looks absolutely nothing like the final version. So <laughs> we'll watch you through why. Um, so this is the first thing I laid out trying to achieve the things that um, I wanted to test on the course. So maybe Sarah can walk us through it. It starts at the tire. Yeah, so here goes I'm gonna, to the which, Yeah, can you draw the path real quick? Okay, and y'all, you'll probably want to go full screen as much as you can, but um, I've got the ability here to kind of draw the path, so that'll help a little bit. So go ahead, Heather. We start with the tire. Okay, we start with the tire, um, and then it goes to the teeter to number three, um, which is the jump straight ahead, and then it has a turn. So that turn has a little um, opportunity for the dog to go wide just because they're sighting that tunnel off of a long straight line. Um, and then they get to the A-frame, which is what, number four? Mm -hmm. So what I liked about having that A-frame tunnel combination in relation to jump three is that it, it sort of makes it preferred to do either a blind or a front or something on the A-frame where the handler would be on the opposite side from the judge, being that I would be on the side by the teeter, um, to make that contact um, likely to be highly judgeable, which is really important. So at national championships, there's a second judge helping with the dog walk contact, but not the A-frame or the seesaw. So I may, needed to make sure um, that the handler wouldn't be in my way on those obstacles. Let's see, and then it goes down into kind of a slicey line similar to what ended up on the final course. Um, back up, and then here I had an element. Now it goes, yeah, let's see, was that time? The dog walk, okay, yeah, dog walk, um, weaves. And then turn back from the weaves. And so I have been seeing a couple trends. First trend, I've been seeing a lot of difficult weave entries at kind of the big events and also local trials. And I feel like most teams and most handlers and dogs are very, very skilled at weave entries. So what I really wanted to test was weave exits. I've been noticing in some trials I've judged over the past couple of years that when I make a challenging weave exit, it's been um, much more difficult for the teams than having a challenging weave entry. So I would, I thought I would challenge the weave exit to kind of separate the people um, who were who had the whole whole skill down on the weaves versus those that only kind of really worked the hard entries, which is really popular and were kind of sacrificing working those exits. So I did want to challenge weave exits as one of my obstacle tests. Then you go across the line of jumps then it, I figured most handlers would cross the triple, so I thought that was a little bit of a jumping skill. Um, it goes to 15, and then it had the tunnel sends where you had to pretty much layer the second tunnel, so I felt like that was an obstacle commitment skill. Um, and then I think it just has kind of a fast line out. So I like the fast line out. It makes for a little bit exciting finish. Um, the problem with this one, um, first of all, when I looked at the boxes it checked versus the list that I wanted to achieve, it didn't check all the boxes. So I need, knew it needed more work to be a true finals course. The second big biggest concern I had was the judging pass. So um, places the judge needs to be on course. So when it's a tire, um, the judge needs to be either not on the side of the tire, like either on the opening side or the exit side so that you can see through the circle of the tire and I'll be looking at um add it from the side to make sure the judge is the dog is jumping the tire and not through the frame um so with the teeter being number two that was okay i could see the tire 
I was a little worried about handlers being in my way of seeing a good view of the teeter. So that was a little concern. I felt pretty good about being at the A-frame where I'd be on the teeter side and then I would cross behind the handler. But here's where it gets really ugly. So as a handler runs up the line to the dog walk, the judge needs to be on the approach side of the off course tunnel to see if any dog puts a paw in. So therefore I had to be on the approach side of the dog walk. I had to be within 20 feet of the dog walk, which means I had to make it all the way past the triple to where I could see the approach of the off course tunnel and the opening of the dog walk, which A, I don't think I can get there with the speed of the dogs. B, I would be totally in the hammer and dog's way. So that was definitely a no go. Um, so, and then, so I think ahead. what you're you're saying is that you were going to um, kind of have a judging path that was kind of like went this way and blue yeah. on this side and of the then, apron. Yes. Then you have to get all the way up here Correct. to be able to see the dog yes. walk in the tunnel. Yes, there is. No, yeah, and when I laid that out, I'm like, there's no way this is happening. So this course was pretty much done for. Um, and yeah, I think, that's probably enough on the judging path. Right. I, yeah. And this is one of the things that I think is is super important for um, people to get just a little taste of, because I'm not a judge, um, but I have read the judge's rule book. And I encourage everybody to read the judge's rule book, because a lot of um, design decisions happen because of the rules of judging and where judges have to be in relation to different obstacles to be able to judge things like refusals and off courses and contacts and things like that. And they're pretty, pretty, um, you know, quite a few rules that you have to like meet. Right. All, All right. right. So, so then, said, okay, stick, change this up and see what I can do to help my judging path and still maintain the skills and try to check few more boxes. So I went to the next revision. Uh oh, it's not going to the there next slide. There we go. All right. Let's see. So the path one, two, three, you know, kind of the flow to the A-frame was really similar. Um, but then I made it go triple weave so that I would have plenty of time to get up there while the dog is weaving. Let's see. I'm looking up at the top. Okay. And here the weave exit skill is um, leaving the dog in the weaves to get to where you can control the turn at 10 being really close to 10. So I was thinking that people would leave the dogs in the weaves eight while the dog's weaving, um, run past nine and be in position to do like a front blind at 10, 11 um, to set that line to the tunnel 12. So I felt like that still tested the weave exits, so which I is something this. they really wanted to do. Then it went to the panel jump. Yep, there we go. Okay. Um, to the dog walk tunnel, if you could just do the flow on out, just mm -hmm. so people know where it goes. And I'll tell you a couple of problems with this course. So I built this in my yard and I ran it as I do um, pretty much all of my courses. Um, I just feel like it, they don't always run like they look on paper. So I always like to run them. I'm pretty fortunate that I have a lot of land and all the obstacles and some dogs. So I'm able to do that. Um, when I ran it, it felt quite easy and so i was concerned that it didn't really meet the challenge level i was looking for i didn't have any issues um, running it with my dogs but the biggest concern i have if you look at can you blow up the right map a little so i'm mm -hmm. trying to see the numbers um the 11 12 13 14 15 and you think about where the handler is going running kind of parallel to the dog on that dog walk where my judging path would be is you need to be on the side of the weave. So I would be, you know, at the side of the weaves watching the dog weave. Then after they turn 10, 11 and go into 12, I would cut behind the handler, but I need to be able to see where I could see the exit of tunnel 12 in case after the dog wrapped 13, they went back in the tunnel. I'd need to make sure they didn't put a paw in there. Like if they wrapped the wrong way or something, um, so that puts me kind of behind, kind of close to the handler. So then if all goes well for the handler, when they go to run that dog walk, I'm right smack in their way. So that is not going to work. So this course was done for <laughs> when I laid out the judging path. Let's see. So then I went to the next one. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. The other problem with the judging path on the one on the left is after they took tunnel 13 when they're going 14 15 i'm still kind of in their way 
So I tried to tweak the ending to see if maybe I could be farther from the dog walk, like the full 20 feet away, kind of tuck behind, jump 16 and 13 on the one on the right. Okay, um, wait, so, sorry, I'm gonna catch up here. So like, yeah. where, where are the changes here? Okay, let's see, the changes. It's the same. The ending is what changed. Okay, so we have So you 12, see on the first 13. one, yeah. So it went 14. So on the one on the left coming out that 15 foot tunnel, they went right across right where I'd still be from judging the dog walk. So I'm not in the way once, I'm in the way twice. On the second one, I changed the ending so that after, yeah, to try and get out of the way, it still really wasn't um, great. I ran it again. I still felt like it was a little bit easy. I still felt like I'd be in the way at the dog walk, so I didn't like that. And the other problem I had with, with where my judging path would be when the dog was taking 18, 19, 20, I'd still be kind of up at, what number is that, 16, between kind of 16 and 11. And the A-frame when I walked this judging path was totally blocking my view of 19, where I couldn't see if the dog was doing 18, 19 correctly or pausing and potentially getting a refusal. So I could not see that. Um, with the A-frame blocking my view. So this one, for judging reasons, um, was also a no-go. Yeah. So next slide. Yeah, so somebody said they love that you run it. So so we talked about this. We had a <laughs> webinar with Heather with our VIP, and, and you said that's like a part of your process for the majority right. of your courses, right? Yes, I'm a very slow course designer um, because I build and run all my master and premier courses before I submit them to AKC. I feel like for me, that's really important because things on paper don't necessarily look for me like they feel when I run them. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, um, next slide. Okay. Let's see. Hang on, I gotta get my notes to the next slide. Mm -hmm. All right, so here um, I do more flexing with the ending. Um, do you wanna just run them through the path on this one, Sarah? I think it's the same up through the tunnel 15. Okay. Maybe from 15 to the ending. So one, two, three, four, five. Oh, okay. I see. Just so just start with like. Yeah, you know, like we'll start, start here. 15. 14, yeah. 15, 16, 17, 18, ends 19. 19. And th that's yeah. the end? Yeah, it ends on 19. So that one, it, it eliminated the problem where the A frame was blocking my view. Couple concerns of this one. A, I feel like I'm still in the way when the handler's running the dog walk. And the other thing that's different is when you go from the teeter, oh, it was actually on that one, I forgot to talk about it. Between the first rev and these two revs on the teeter, I made that jump three, four farther out and had that ending jump um, 17 in there. If you can circle 17. Okay, I'm looking. On the right course. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'm like, oh, okay, I see it. I have a. Okay. There we go. That so one. the problem I was thinking now with that when I ran it with my dogs is if the handler goes up after the teeter with their dog to number three and to number four, and with the way the tunnel is under the A-frame, when I ran it, I did not blind and get on the other side of the A-frame. It actually felt a lot more comfortable to run with your dog and have your dog on your left going over the A-frame, which means the handler is likely to block my view of the A-frame contact. So. I didn't actually realize it in the previous one, but I realized it when I ran this one. So I didn't like that either. So this course was also no good. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide. So close, so close. So, but we're getting there. Then I said, I cannot make this course work at all. I'm gonna go back to the beginning and totally start from scratch. So when I start from scratch, what I generally do is lay a bunch of obstacles on my course dimensions and I try to start putting together sequences of three or four obstacles that I really like that are I feel like are unique um, that meet the test elements that I'm trying to test and then once I get one or two or three short little sequences that I really like that's kind of what I call the heart of the course and then I just rotate them around and put stuff in between to make it flow so that's my philosophy so I kind of call it the course design shuffle um, so I went back to the total beginning, did the course design shuffle and came up with what's on the next slide. So when you say the, the obstacle shuffle, is that 
a function of clean run course designer? Do they? No, do, oh no, that's what I call it. That's me oh, okay. taking my mouse and and dragging things around until I find a couple little short sequences that I like. Oh, okay, got it, got <laughs> it. And I just wanted to put up a couple of the comments here. So Kathleen says, appreciate you considering handler's path, especially when handling with distance. And you yourself handle with a lot of distance. Yes, I do. Yeah. <laughs> And then Bonnie says, amazing to see all the judges do when planning a course like this for finals. Um, and uh, yeah, so then we'll keep going here. Okay, so you went back to the beginning and scrapped everything. I went back and scrapped everything and started over because I just got really frustrated with that course. And I really didn't feel like I would ever be able to resolve being in the handler's way on the dog walk, no matter what I did with that layout. So, so I, I said, just start over. So I know we're going to talk a little bit about it at some point, but um, had you yet submitted anything to reps or AKC or all of this was just the revisions that you were having with yourself? Okay. So uh, my normal rep is Lisa Dempsey, who's amazing, but for national championships, Arlene um, Spooner was the rep for all of us judges. So I did send some courses to Arlene saying this is very draft don't send it. you know eventually all the reps take a look but I was just like Arlene you take a look at this and just let me know if it feels like I'm kind of on track or not on track and I was collaborating more with Arlene but all my courses I was like this is draft this is not final I'm not happy with it you know it's not ready for review but look at it and if you have any ideas um let me know and let's kind of work together and get something that's really great. And she was wonderful. And you'll find that she actually suggested what turned out to be the best element of the final course. And the last draft was actually Arlene's idea. And as soon as she said it and I looked at it, I was like, that's it, Arlene, we got it. This is the course. So I, awesome. I really appreciate um, her collaboration. She's really, really good. But in the, the, the first four drafts, yeah. you had sent some of those and everything? And then yeah, Scott I had sent a couple of like, to Arlene. Really it was that. like, I don't really like this. Here's my concerns. What are your thoughts? And we were just, nah. yeah, no. But I don't think, I don't know. But, you know, I, I clear, made it clear to her that they were draft. They weren't ready for review by, like, the whole committee. Right, right, right. All, All right. right. So I came up with a totally new course. So do you want to kind of walk people through this totally new yeah. course? So and there's actually one before familiar. this that I didn't send you. Yeah, yeah, it's starting to look a little familiar. Here's one, two. That looks familiar. Three, four, five, six. That looks familiar. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. 10, 11, 12, 13. Yeah. We have a straight tunnel here, 14. Back into the tunnel. So that's definitely different. And then you have a backside here. Yeah, and actually and make a comment before this version, but I didn't save it. When I first built this, what I wanted was out tunnel 15 to go over the panel to a 270 to what is that? Um, 16 to the A-frame. Like this. Yeah, but I didn't mm -hmm. even save it because there's eyes on jump number one. And so it's not safe to have a dog slice jump number mm -hmm. one where they could hit the eyes. So I right. didn't even save that version, but that was my initial. And then I went to this where it was the backside 15. Got it. I so, mean, 16, backside 16. So it seems like the biggest difference is kind of in the, the ending here where we have yeah. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, backside, A frame and out. Correct. Yep. All yeah, right. so there's a couple differences. Um, the big ones is jump three. Well, we'll go through them as we go, but I'll just, I guess I'll hit them so I don't forget. Jump three got moved a little bit to the right. I feel like a lot of people have been putting a ton of effort into training running dog walk. So I really wanted the obstacle next to be straight off the dog walk to just really showcase the running dog walks and all the work that people have been putting into them. So you'll see in the final version that jump three is actually moved to the right so that it's straight. The reason why I had it to the left, when I came up with the the idea for this course i wanted it so that some handlers would run on the right side of the dog walk and some handlers would run on the left side of the dog walk so if you could send from 13 to 14 you could be on the right side of the dog walk kind of serp your dog into tunnel 15 and be really good positioned for a slice for 16 a, a slice blind to 17 18 and if you didn't have a send to um, 13, 14, which is the jump in the straight tunnel, that you could go in with dog on right 11, 12, and blind between 13 and 14. So now you're putting your dog on your left 
into tunnel 14 and you're on the kind of the opposite side of the dog walk from the judge. And then when I ran it that way, I did like a um, force, not a force front, like a half front. I don't know what you call it, where you rotate into your dog to get my dog into 15. Well, my so dog like you're talking 15. about handling it over here, right? No, the other side no? of the dog walk. Oh, okay. Line between, so put the handler's path. Let's okay. see. So, so one way to run it is like this. handler. Handler has dog on right, 13, 14. Handler sends. Oh, I'm sorry, the numbers are so small. I'm sorry. No, dog on good. right, 10, 11. Handler sends to 12, 13, 14. So the handler is on the judge's side of the dog walk or the side by most of the course. And the dog is in ascend on the other side of the dog walk. Okay, so the dog goes this way and the handler yeah. goes like this way. Correct. And then the mm -hmm. handler meets the dog at the, the straight tunnel, sends him into 15. And then the handler is easily ahead enough to push to the backside of 16 and do like a slice push blind mm -hmm. and have a dog on left. Okay, so that was one handler path. The other handler path that I thought people could use if they did not feel confident doing that distant send 13, 14, is that the handler could run with the dog on right over 11, 12, 13, and blind between 13 and 14. So now they have dog on left. So now you just turn into your dog, say tunnel, tunnel, the dog goes in 15. When the dog's going in 15, the handler just keeps running and makes it and meets them at the exit of 15. And now you're kind of on the line for a really easy curl at 16 over the left wing. Yep, to 17 to 18. And I actually ran up both those ways and both worked. Um, the problem is, let's see, number one, when I sent my dog with path one where I handled from the side where most of the course is on through tunnel 14, I we basically had a collision coming out of 14 because <laughs> there just was not enough time for the handler to maneuver. So that was definitely not safe. Um, and that was my biggest concern. Um, yeah, so that was that was the major issue with that one. The other concern I had, that dashed line that you see um, kind of in the middle of the course is a judging path. Mm -hmm. So you can see I start um, start kind of where I did in real life, go up to see the dog walk contact. And then the, the weave pulls are not very judgeable if you're on either side looking like straight at the line or at the plane of the weave pulls. You really need to be to the side of the pull. So you have that side view to be able to clearly see if a dog um, skips a pull or not. So that's why my judge's path kind of goes over there by the triple. That was to be able to get a view of the weave poles. And I didn't like that um, because I didn't know if I could get there. And I was worried I would be in the way of the handler when they're going from the weaves to the triple to the teeter. So that was not good about this course either. And then you see those little um, dotted lines. Mm -hmm. This one. This so one. what those are for is to show the angle of the mouth of the tunnel. So one of the requirements from for judging path in the American Kennel Club is that the judge can see both the entry and exit of all tunnels um, when the dog is taking it, and also when it presents an off-course option. So I like to draw those little dotted lines on the plane of the tunnel exit. So when I draw my judging path, I can make sure I can be um, on the plane of those tunnel entries and exits, because that's one thing that's kind of easy to miss. Mm -hmm. That's what those dotted lines are. All right, so this one's a no-go because A, it's dangerous, and B, I don't think I can judge the weaves. Okay. So next slide. Let's see. Okay, so on this one, what I did was I changed the 15-foot tunnel to a 20-foot tunnel. I also changed a little bit the angles of the other tunnel um, just to make it flow. I really wanted um, to be able to, if the handler was on the far side, like if they did that blind into tunnel 14, I wanted the dog to have a reasonable chance of finding the mouth of tunnel 15. So that's why I changed the other um, tunnel. That was after kind of testing it with my dogs and seeing um, where they could see it or where they wouldn't. When I had the, the second, the tunnel 15 set up like in the first diagram, mm -hmm. but the tunnel 14 with the new longer tunnel mm -hmm. and I did the side where you blinded, where the handler was on the far side of the dog walk. Mm -hmm. What was really interesting is my dog was not seeing the entry of tunnel 15. It was coming all the way around to the wrong 
entry of that tunnel. So Coming it was like this side. going in 14. Yeah. But then when I changed that tunnel 15, like the entry to make it more visible to the dog, they didn't have any trouble. So it's like the entry kind of point pointing this way versus pointing yeah. down more. Yeah. Yeah. They told it my dogs totally couldn't find it when it was still pointing down. And I'm like, well, this isn't, I don't really want that to be a challenge. Yeah. Okay. So I think that's all this changed on that one. I still have to deal with the weave issue. Right. But it's getting better. Okay. Next slide. Let me change my slide. Okay. Finally, we get there. So this one um, was within consulting with um, Arlene as well as Carrie. So Carrie suggested um, with the weaves, if I angled them a little bit more to the red, that I could actually judge them from the opposite side. So you see where my judging path for the weaves is now on the side by jump 11. Okay. Which is where I actually judge them from. And I had a great view and I was opposite side of the weaves from most of the handlers. So it worked out perfect. Because and then they're once angled I saw like the dog this exit 12, yep. instead of this. Yep. yep, yep, exactly. So it just made it a little more, gave me a little more side view where I felt comfortable. And then when the dog exits 12, of course, I can easily get down there to the teeter. We have to be within 20 feet of the teeter contact, so that's a pretty good um, distance away, so no problem. I just had to make sure I was out of the way by the time the dog jumped in. And here we see our, our okay. straight off running contacts. Yeah, and then um, we got it moved the, over to get the straight running contact. Yeah. Also, the ending, oh, I forgot. The ending um, with that whole backside blind, it, it felt like just too much. And it just, I didn't want a bunch of people to mess up there right at the end. Um, so this option, um, which was kind of collaborating with Arlene, this whole last course was collaborating with mostly Arlene and also Carrie. They were fabulous. That, that last ending line is fast and exciting and a much less technical finish, which makes for really a lot better um, spectator appeal. And, and I could still clearly see the um, A-frame contact because there was a center for the handler to be ahead. Um, we fixed the weed poles. And then Arlene said, I was worried, I was still worried even with the longer tunnel at 14, that there still could be a collision between the handler and the dog. And so, but I was so engrossed and I want people to handle from both sides of the dog walk that I didn't think about making, adding in that jump number 15 as a wrap. And when Arlene said, well, what if you just have them go over 15? And I looked at it, I'm like, this is it. This is the course. I love it. And I started thinking of all the boxes checked. I'm like, this course is what I want. And so this is actually the final version. Um, so thanks to Arlene. She's fabulous. And then it also added oh, like, wait. a choice yeah, element. One more thing. Yeah, one more thing. If you look at the course dimensions, you can't really tell very well, but they actually gave me five more feet. Because if you look on the course on the left, let's see what the numbers are. I think it's 12 to 13 up there in the corner. Yeah, you can just tell because of the, the width of, yeah. of this, here, this box here. <laughs> yeah, so another danger zone. 12 to 13, if the dog gets on kind of a line where they're jumping 13 on a big slice towards the wall, that wasn't really much towards the wall on the left. Mm -hmm. Like if they slight, if they get on a weird line where they jump 13 on a slice, they're only about like 12 feet from that barrier. And in AKC, you know, they're very, it's very important that we have sufficient distance between the obstacles and the barrier so that if a dog does get on a bad line and they're jumping towards a barrier, they don't crash into it. So um, Carrie actually let me make the ring five feet wider to resolve that issue. So now you can see if they jump on a slice, they have a few more feet and they're, they're not going to like jump and crash that barrier. So I really appreciated that. All right, next slide. Oops, sorry. Let me get mine on the next. Oh, this one has all my notes. Okay, mm -hmm. so this was the final version. So then I checked it against my checklist and I'm like, this is it. So jumping skills. So I felt like they're up at 15. Um, was a good test of collection in the midst of a whole ton of extension. Um, so I also felt like there was lots of slices and taking jumps from different angles, um, different crosses by the handler. So I felt like it did check the box to um, show that the dog does have a variety of jumping skills. I felt like um, it showed turning skills um, and the handler's ability to, to, to understand strategically which were the important turns to control um, and which were okay for the dog to just keep running um, fast without a lot of control. 
So the, the turns that needed control, I felt like were three, five, nine, and 15. Where Here, wait, my dog on, I'm going to circle, oh, yeah, circle those. those? Yeah, okay, yeah. Three. Let's see. So three. Oh, wait. Hold on. Yeah, three is a turn into the 270 off the dog walk where a dog could potentially go extremely wide, especially with that those running dog walks. So the three to four. That, that yeah. was the big one, yeah. Yeah, three to four. Let's see. Uh, five. Five to six. So, yeah, so if you got on a big loop coming at four square and you're on a big loop coming at five, so that whole sequence there and the turn to the weaves was a pretty um, sharp turn that I didn't know if everybody would realize um, how sharp that turn really was. Let's see. Then nine. Uh, nine. Oh, yeah, nine. Mm -hmm. I really like nine because um, if you could trust your dog on the teeter and be up there at nine, it was a lot easier to control that turn. So it was like kind of a double. It was like, do you know this turn is important? There's a big old tunnel out there calling the dog far enough away that dogs are not likely to go off course to it, but close enough that it's likely to cause a wide turn if they sight it. Um, let's see, nine and the other one was 15. Uh, let's see. Oh, 15 is the right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you can actually wrap either direction, um, which I liked. And you're going from a huge extended line to something like where you really want to be quite collected, not only to get a nice turn, but also to prevent going off course to like the backside of 16 or um, the backside of 10 if you wrap the other way. Oh, if you go back this way? Let's, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see. So it, it checked the dog skills that I wanted to test, which is the jumping skills and the turning skills. So I'm like, okay, we're good there. Now the handler, um, proprioception. So the whole sequence, 14, 15, 16. So you see where the exit of tunnel 14 is not aimed directly at the center of jump 15? Mm -hmm. What I like about that is if you do, say you do 13, 14, and then you blind cross the exit of 14. If you don't realize you need to go deep enough and you go just past the exit of 14 as a handler and you start running towards that jump, you're basically blocking the dog's view of the jump they may be able to see the wing and you're kind of setting the dog on a path for the backside. Like this way so, or like No, no, way? the other way. Yeah. Like if the handler, you see like right. if the handler blind crosses 14 and the handler runs towards that jump, mm -hmm. it's very easy to not be deep enough and send your dog to the backside. So that was like a spatial awareness thing for the handler. And then that whole after they wrap where, you know, there's a lot going on there. Can you be in the right position? Um, that your dog knows it's tunnel 16 and not the off course um, exit of 14. So I felt like that whole part tested the handler's spatial awareness, um, which is the handler side of the team. Um, and then for all the handler, I also wanted some strategy, which was kind of on 15, um, which way to wrap, um, how to turn it, what maneuvers to do. And then let's see, dog training. So in the dog training, um, the first thing I wanted to have was handler choices. So I felt like there were tons of handler choices if you trusted your dog. If you didn't trust your dog and you stayed with them to help, you ended up like doing all rear crosses, which for me and a lot of people, I think doing rear crosses is the least, makes it the most difficult to control a turn versus being in a front um, or a blind where you're more ahead and control the turn easier. So. I felt like um, if you trusted the dog, you could do any handling you want. If you didn't, you were kind of um, stuck with tons of rear crosses. Let's see, um, it tested commitment in the send, so that 13 to 14 send. It's about equivalent to a send that you would see in open fast, like if the dog walk was replaced by fast tape. So I felt like open fast was about the right level because I know not everybody does fast, not everybody, but does distance. So I wanted to send, but not something like way extreme or too difficult. So I thought that was about right. Um, and then I definitely wanted um, dog training to um, showcase dogs that had good, solid, well-trained, independent obstacle execution and handlers that trusted that execution. So for, of course, the weave pulls, um, trusting the entry, you could control the turn five to six and then trust that you could rear cross. And then the exit, if you could leave them, you could get downstream to seven to eight to nine, all trying to get to 
beat the dog to nine so you could desaddle and control that turn at nine. So all that kind of started at the weaves. Um, the seesaw, leaving the dog on the seesaw also helped control the turn at nine. And then trusting your A-frame at 17 to get ahead for that final line, 18, 19. Um, trusting that A-frame, I felt also was um, a good independent. To, can the dog do it on their own? And so with going through that versus my checklist, what I wanted to test, I was really um, happy with this course. I felt like it met everything I was trying to achieve. And that's kind of where we landed. So that's yeah. what I got for you. No, it's fantastic. And and um, I've said many times that one of the things that I look for when I'm looking at a course, um, when I'm like a, a finals level course, um, I like a course where uh, there are opportunities for mistakes in multiple places. And even with the best dogs running it, mistakes are made at multiple places. Um, because it just from a spectator point of view, it, there's so much more excitement and nuance when you're never quite sure you know, if the dog's going to be able to, you know, it's a nail biter, you're never quite sure that they're going to make it through. Um, and, and you kind of have, and then as a competitor, you have to hold it together the whole time. You can't just like get through, you know, quote the hard part and then be home free. There's always something else that you're constantly having to, to like reach for. So I felt like that's exactly what we saw as spectators. We saw mistakes all over the place in different spots in different ways. And I think that makes for a really interesting finals. Yeah, it was all pretty cool to watch. I all enjoyed right. every second of it. <laughs> you were grinning from ear to ear. You were it so was excited. so fun. I could have judged dogs all night. I was completely enjoying it. <laughs> and then I just wanted to send my thank you to some people who helped with this course. So I talked many times about Arlene. She was fantastic. She was very collaborative. I felt very comfortable telling her, this is a draft. I don't like it. Here's my issues. You know, what do you think? And she'd give me honest feedback. So thank you, Darlene. Um, all the AKC reps, they were so supportive. They worked so hard. If you've never been behind the scenes at the national championship, you, it's hard, the, the reps are there for very long hours and every one of them never stops. They work so hard at that event. So I really appreciate them for that. And then Carrie also for helping with review and input and especially for giving me five foot more to the ring. <laughs> it's awesome. Bigger, I like that. Made it all work. Yeah. So so now what I'm going to do is go through um, and put some of the comments up and any questions that we have here. And if y'all have other questions about the event, we've got about 18 minutes before we hit one hour. Um, so let's start here. So uh, you talked a lot about like the traps that you um, basically planned, you know, like mm -hmm. I, always, I always know that there's things that judges are um, uh, testing me, you know, <laughs> and waiting to see if I fall for their trap. Yeah. Um, but then, yeah, did the did anything come into play with the broadcast team, with the camera angles, with the sponsorship by you move? Like, did any of that come into the play or not at all? Okay, so first, um, most of the trap areas I expected. The one that I didn't, and when the first dog did it, like I was like pausing before I made my call because my brain was like, what's going on here? Was when the dog would route 15, and run past the run out plane of 16 because they were seeing the dog walk and some dogs actually even got on the dog walk. Are you talking about so this run out? Yeah, the run out's at, six, at 16 or the run out wrong course at 16. I did not even have that on my radar. All the other mistakes I kind of um, guessed might pop up here and there and I was ready for them. But actually I think several dogs did that. And when the first one did it, I was like, where's that dog going? And then when the second one did it, I'm like, oh, they're sighting that dog walk and not tunnel 16. So that was the one that was a surprise. Mm -hmm. And then um, as far as the camera, so I'm an engineer, so it is very nerdy, but I was really excited to see it. Scott Stock showed me this picture that was like my course map. And then AKC had sent it, I guess, to ESPN and Avast or whoever um, does the lighting and stuff. And they had actually overlaid on my course map, like where the cameras were going to go, where they needed to dig trenches to run wiring, like to put cameras out on the course, where there was actually a microphone under the A-frame so you could hear like thump thump when the dog like runs the A-frame. I mean, they had that all drawn out like on a drawing. I thought it was so cool. Yeah, so, you yeah, so I think in case he sends a course and then the camera people figure out, you know, they have time. They're not doing a day of, they're in advance. They have the course and they're 
figuring out how they need to do the lighting and the cameras and the microphones and all that. So when they come, it's all drawn out and they just build it like that. But they do it based on your course. They don't Correct. ask you to make any changes Correct. for their benefit. Yeah, I think Correct. I think some people might be surprised by that. And I don't know if West, Westminster is the same or different in, in terms of how they handle it as well. So they enjoy, uh, let's see, they yeah. like the idea of the challenging. Um, this is pretty, I, I think is really insightful to, to get to see into her head how she's all doing it. Yeah, I don't know if Sherry I mentioned says that she, Did I mention on mm -hmm. regular courses, like at regular trials? So the difference to me, and if I already said this, Sarah, correct me, I can't remember if I did or not. Um, if I'm designing for like a regular local trial, I'll decide like I want to test um, handler appropriate reception, or I want to test dog turning skills, or I want to test um, independent performance of the weave poles. But I'm not going to try and test all of those things on the same course. I might test one one day and something different the next day to mix it up for different dogs that have different strengths. But for a national finals, I kind of put all of the tests on the same course. So that's a little bit of difference between like designing a master standard for a local trial versus a NAC finals in my mind of, of how I thought about it differently. So I just wanted to share that. Yeah. Um, Sherry says that she, she always got the feeling that your courses were so well thought out and now we have the proof of how thought out <laughs> yeah. it was. Um, so, uh, Michael says he's glad that the tire ended up for last or first. That happens a lot because of the uh, judging, right? Uh, because you yeah. may be able to see it a certain way. Correct. Yeah, yeah. I really like to put it last or first if I can. Okay. Um, okay. And then just walking through here. So lots of people who ran the course <laughs> and enjoyed oh, it. Good. Yeah, That's yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, and we kind of talked about this in general. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, I can. I'll tell you my biggest fear, like going into nationals, if people hated my courses, I was going to be absolutely crushed because I put like everything I had into these courses. I'm like, if they're, if everybody hates these courses, I'm like going to quit judging forever too. And so I feel happy that people that like them and maybe it really, I put everything, it made me really happy. Yeah. Let's see. You, I, didn't, I missed the question to somebody else. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, no. I, th I think you had answered it already about okay. like, being surprised at handlers. Oh, um, uh, yeah. So I totally agree with this. And then, uh, so you said you would have been crushed if people hadn't yeah. liked it. But when you were there, like after it ran, like, yeah. did you just, did you just know, like, I crushed this? <laughs> like, no, did you know I just by watching no the idea. dogs and everything? Yeah, no, I didn't know. And I'm kind of excited to watch it on AKC.TV this weekend. Because when you're judging, like, you don't, you're so concentrating on the, the things that you need to watch that you don't really see the whole flow. I couldn't tell you like what dogs cued and what dogs didn't. And it it's like, you're very in the moment when you're judging, you're not just like spectating. It's a lot different. Right. So yes, I know I had no idea, but I knew I was having an excellent fun time watching the dogs run. <laughs> and they were going fast, which I love. Yeah, yeah. They were amazing. Everybody that made the finals, huge congrats. You guys were incredible. Oh, so they said uh, it was a blast to run. Um, so this comment was that the the send was a little bit easier for the larger dogs. Yeah, I totally <laughs> agree. It so is. here's the thing. Get this. So I've always, well, in the I've done agility since '98, but since like 2001, I've always had log, large dogs. I had a 16 inch dog. Like those were my first dog, but I've had 20s and 24s. I run a very large Irish Setter currently. However, I decided that I need to get a medium or small dog so that I could be a better judge. And understand small dogs. So my next dog is going to be a working cocker. So I'll hopefully be in 12 or 16. So that will give me a little more perspective for you little guys. So <laughs> maybe maybe I won't do quite such so large right. type courses. So there you go. Yeah, I've run both uh, small uh, or not small, but medium and large. And I think sends are usually easier with the bigger dogs, but then the off courses are yeah. so much worse. <laughs> yeah, it's off true. There's pros cool. and cons. Yep, yeah, exactly. so I'll let you know in about seven years if I change my perspective. Probably I won't because <laughs> I like um, I do distance, so yeah. So yep, so they said 15. Jump 15. I know, jump 15 was like the best part of the whole course. And when Arlene got my brain out of, I have to have handlers running on both sides of the dog walk and said, What if you wrap that? And as soon as I looked at it, I'm like, That's it. 
Yeah, yep. I agree. That, it was it was cool. That was so Thanks, awesome. Ellie. And people are loving the explanation. Yeah, it's not too geeky. <laughs> no, not at all. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So this person says as a spectator, they kept worrying that the dog was going to clip the handler in the tunnel area under the, um, dog. Oh, I guess like when people were like making that blind oh, yeah. cross the 15. Yeah. But I think, well, so I, I'll, I'll let you answer in a second, but I will say that, um, that my view on that as like, uh, I guess as an instructor or as, or as a handler also is that you didn't force people to make that cross. They had the option. Correct. They could turn either way on 15. So it's like, it was like you had, I guess that's the proprioception thing again, too. Yeah. You have to know, can you make it? Can you not? And if you can't, you have other options. Yeah, correct. That, that's kind of how I felt about it. Whereas when it was like tunnel to tunnel, you didn't have much choice. But right. here you could handle with dog on right coming out of 14 and rear 15 or wrap 15 and then send dog on left to 16. But yeah, if somebody misjudged, but fortunately um, there weren't any incidents. So that was good. Yeah. And then they said, love the two tunnels and the challenges that came with it. Um, okay. People are going to set this up. That's the other thing about um, the finals course is that classes all over the United mm -hmm. States are setting this up, right? This week, next week, whatever. Like people are going to set this up and run it just for fun. And so it's kind of, you know, it, it's going to keep being out there and, and people are going to get that chance. Cool. Send me videos if you run it, especially yeah. if your dog does something spectacular or something <laughs> odd. <laughs> right. That'd be awesome. Yeah. I, I think um, uh, we should have people tag you on their uh, finals videos too, yes. because you mentioned yes. wanting to rewatch it, but we all know that AKC TV likes their like multiple camera angle cuts. So yes, I, I mean, it, it'll be interesting to watch, but in terms of you getting to have a feeling of flow, like that is not something you're going to get from the AKC yeah. TV. So hopefully people can tag you with their runs so that you can uh, see the like four legged flicks view or the spectator view as well. Uh, oh, so Karen awesome. said she just missed out on running. No, point three four. That's so uh, sad. Yeah. Oh, I'm so sad. Okay. So this is okay. So this is interesting. We talked about this in the Wednesday wrap up. Stefan talked about this in the Wednesday wrap up because the announcers were making a big deal about the 16 inch dogs um, not making it through this course. And what happened was um, at the end of the 16 inch class, th their Q rate was pretty much in line with the other heights. But it took a while to get a clean, like you got like a string of in cues. And so they, there was this perception that the 16 inch class wasn't doing well when as a whole, they did just fine. But this person wants to know, like, did you like, were you sweating at all? Or did you, did you notice so many 16 inch no. dogs didn't even notice? Yeah, yeah, no, I didn't. And when I judge, it's like very in the moment, like I don't even really remember what the last dog did because I'm in the moment. You can't like be thinking about the last dog and be concentrating on the dog. I had to really block out everything, all the stuff going around, all the crowd screaming and just, it's difficult. It was also difficult in ring one where they had the announcer like in mm -hmm. the preliminary rounds when the announcer's talking about the dog, <laughs> you, you, you like have to not get sucked into listening to the announcer and just like really concentrate on judging because you can get distracted and like forget that you're judging so, yeah, so no i didn't i honestly so when i watch it back hopefully this weekend on akc tv um i'll let you know what i think about the 16 inch dogs oh, sorry awesome. about that i don't know <laughs> and then this uh sherry wants to know if you expect yeah. it of course once too yeah oh it's, yeah and that was another out, training yeah. element so I, I people with start line stays definitely had a huge advantage which i consider a training if you tried to slingshot your dog from one to two with dog on left, that tunnel became very tempting. So I tried to make it like an advantage for, uh, you know, that was another dog training element I forgot to put on my list. Yeah. Okay. They said, uh, yeah, yeah, this is, yeah. This is a common, common thing. Um, I don't know. I don't know what we can do about that. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's not, like all the other ones I'm totally with you. I know. I they have I been told. <laughs> They've uh, been told. Uh, okay. And they said, yeah, they agree. Favorite courses have multiple challenges without a high Q rate. 
Um, love all the thought that you put in. Uh, we already talked about whether or not you were surprised. Um, let's see. I think. Uh, yeah, can I make a comment on key rates? That yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yep. So this applies to local AKC trials. So I'm curious of other people's in your local areas. Maybe people can send me a note if they have a strong opinion. But I always hear that like AKC that to be a popular judge, you have to have a high key rate and make courses that a high number of people can queue on. And at least in my area, I find that to be completely not the court not the case at all. And in fact, at our last trial, we had a judge who had amazing course designs. And on Saturday and standard out of probably our trials fill, so you know, with 350, so we probably had 50, 45 or 50 large dogs and 20 and 24 masters. There was only one queue and not one person griped about that course. And we had tons of people that said how much they love that course. And I feel like it's a myth that you know that people want courses that they can queue on that's super easy um and that that's the main criteria most people i don't I, I kind of don't feel that's the case at all in my area where i live and i'm kind of always curious is it something in other areas that's true or is it just a myth so I don't know, maybe we can do a poll or something. Right, right. I mean, I will <laughs> tell you, so I will tell you, I can give you two pieces of data. One is completely, okay. <laughs> completely anecdotal, but I can tell you that uh, in our area, there very much is a tendency to want um, judges with easier courses. Oh, that's and, so sad. And it's, yeah, and it, it's like um, uh, there, are uh, there are judges, and it may have changed in recent years. Yeah. I'm kind of, kind of pulling some of my thoughts years, from yeah from previous years, but there was like a whole list of judges that, um, that the trial organizers wouldn't bring in because people wanted easier courses. So I do think yeah. that it is region dependent. So it depends on okay. where you are, on whether you're going to get, you know, if you want something more easy, you know, then you may not be happy where you are if, if the trend is, you know, more difficult. And if you want to be challenged, you may not be happy where you are if the trend is more easy. And then the other piece of data that I have is that, again, this was also uh, several years ago, I pulled the data for all of the judges and their Q rates on their courses. Mm -hmm. And there was a very strong correlation between Q rate and number of trials that the judge judged. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that they're being brought in because they have a, a high Q rate, it, mm -hmm. you know, but you know, there's, there's, That's there's a question there. <laughs> there's a huh. question. There. Um, okay. So Joyce says 15 feet, three to the wall. So, so she's talking about like up here. Yeah. So, yeah, I didn't measure it. I don't know if it might've been more than 15. When I walked the course, I didn't feel like it was a risk at all. So sometimes I, I don't know because I didn't measure, but sometimes um, like I know our club, our ring, we tell the judges it's 90 by 110, but we actually build or we tell them 90 by 105 and we actually build the ring like 97 by like 112 so that we There's don't already extra, i didn't yeah. i didn't actually 15 is actually the minimum per akc rule so i think that note is to make sure there's at least 15. it felt i didn't measure it but it felt bigger than that and i didn't feel like it was a risk when i walked the court so yeah i don't yeah 15 yeah. is is tight I'll have to look at the, I'll have to look, look at, at the, the video. video. Yeah. To see yeah. how, because it also yeah. was like, that was on the side of the ring that, um, that then goes to the whole rest of the arena so that you, you they had as much room as they wanted in that direction right. to, you know, so it depends on exactly where they set up their ring and their, you know, backdrops yeah. and all of that. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I should have measured that. I didn't measure. I just knew it was like more than 15 because it looked fine. Uh, Brittany says she was so apprehensive when she saw the <laughs> course map, but when she walked it, it all made sense. <laughs> okay. Woo. Yeah. I think that happens a lot. Sometimes it like, it looks a little anxiety provoking on paper, but then, uh, th then it runs really smoothly. Um, oh, here's somebody who ran it in class this week already. Yay. Send me video. <laughs> and then, awesome. uh, this says, do you feel like it was particularly challenging for big dogs versus small dogs or vice versa? No, I feel like it had different challenges for the big dogs and it did for the small, but that they balanced out. 
Yeah. I, I've forgotten the exact um, statistics, but we put the mm -hmm. Q rate in the Wednesday wrap up this week. So if y'all go to baddogagility.com and look at this week's Wednesday wrap up, it'll be for March 22nd. There's a graph in there of the um, Q rate. And it, and oh, that'd be interesting. Was it, how did it come out? Was it pretty balanced? Well, yeah, let me, uh, let me just pull that up here and, um, and I can tell you, I just need to muck on my yeah. computer here for a yeah. second. But yeah, I was... have a couple examples like um, jumping over nine, being drawn wide, you know, by that off course tunnel 14 was definitely, or going to that off course tunnel 14 was definitely a bigger risk for the large dogs. But then the send to the tunnel behind the dog walk, of course, was harder for the small dog. So I felt like, like there were different, but equal number of challenges for all sizes. Right. So Let's here's see the data shows. Oh, look, the 16. So they did do kind of a little worse, but look at those poor, yeah, not much. Those poor 24 inch dogs. And that's my people. That's the class I run. Yeah. Oh, but I would so say sad. there, there were so few dogs, <laughs> right? So yeah, in the 24 inch class, there were like six or seven, I think only. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it, okay. Okay. So it really kind of skews statistically, right? Like one dog in cues. Yeah. And then that, that, that's like, I don't know, I can't do the math in my head, but that's like, you know, yeah. 15 or 20% of the class or whatever, when you have so few dogs, but yeah, like there's here, another large dog. Yeah. Another large dog challenge. The small dogs don't even think about. So that up contact on the seesaw, I was so oh, sad. Yeah. One of the lime runners, you know, it's natural stride right over that up contact, whereas a small dog doesn't even have to worry about that. So it got enough on the seesaw for missing that up contact. So, you know, there's a large dog challenge. So there's, they're just different challenges. Right, right. Exactly. Okay. My goodness. Let's see. Um, Okay. So it says, love it when they get both. Uh, oh, and, and then Mary says, embrace the walker craziness. Oh, I know. I can't wait to get one. They're awesome. Now you're on the hook because you said it publicly. Oh, I'm going to get one. I'm really excited. <laughs> uh, and then let's see. Barb Davis says she likes the course reflected things going on in modern agility. Um, I thought it was really interesting what you said about the send to the tunnel that's under the dog walk being equivalent to an open fast send. Yes. I thought that was like super interesting that you had kind of thought about thought about it to that degree, you know, that it's not just yeah. it's not just a distance element, but that you were like, this is within spec for the um for that class. Yeah, as you mentioned, the reason I have to think that way is I do a lot of distance handling. So for me, something that seems very simple and straightforward for somebody that runs with their dog can be like, you know, a lot challenging because they don't do it all the time. So I tried to make sure it was approximately at the open fast level to not uh, be unfairly advantageous to distance handlers and unfairly disadvantageous. Is that a word to the Mm -hmm. to Tamler. So I'm like, open fast, that's about right. <laughs> so I pretended the dog walk was the line. Ah, the course yardage. <laughs> yeah, did they? A little more than is allowed in normal AKC. Oh, yeah. So I was wondering if they yards. even did it. Sorry, 200 what was it? Yards. 200 yards. 200 yards. Okay. All right. 178 is the, I believe, the limited master standard. So it was yeah. very long. But then again, at national championships, I'm like, this isn't here. It's an athletic event. At local trials, for some people, it's a hobby. For some, it's an athletic event. And for some, it's a combo. But I'm like, at national championships, it's an athletic event. I am fine with a long course with a lot of yards for that reason. Whereas I'm not sure at a local trial, even if AKC allowed it, that I would be comfortable doing the course with that much yards. Right, right. And um, for those of y'all who kind of jumped in to the middle or the end, this um, will remain up on Facebook and up on YouTube and on our website. So don't worry, you can um, check it out then. Um, yeah, this is exactly why we did this. Um, uh, so yeah, I think it was super interesting to hear your perspective, what you were looking for, but then also kind of every, the, everything that changed the course from on the one hand safety, on the other hand, like judges path on the other hand, like view to the T tire. It's like the, everything, there's so many things that have to come together. It's a miracle. We have any courses. <laughs> yeah. That's how I feel. sometimes. And it's like when you design course, I don't know if other judges are like this. Some days I can just design course after course and it seems so easy. And then other days I cannot design a course that works like for the life. I can spend all day and get nothing. It's like very strange. 
I'm curious uh, well, if other judges have that. I mean, now you have this amazing feathers, mm. uh, fe uh, trying to say finals course as a feather in your cap. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, so it was really great. All right, I think we got um, through all of the questions from Rebe. We're a little bit over an hour. Um, thank you so much for for sharing this with everybody. Um, congratulations on getting the assignment. Uh, I don't know how you, um, I, I know you had to keep it a secret for a while. And then you're out building courses all by yourself because you've got to keep it all hush hush. So we all appreciate all of the work that you put into it. And um, I do think that it was an exceptionally well done finals course. So cheers to you. Well, cool. Well, thank you. And thanks to everybody that ran it and everybody that cheered in the crowd. It was really a great time. I remember it forever. Awesome. Thanks. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye.